My name's AJ Grand Scrutton. So I'm the CEO at Delala, but I'm also the creative director on Illusion Island. And I'm Grant Allen, and I'm the lead designer on Illusion Island. What does the thought process on making Illusion Island become this four-player game for all ages? I mean, it is clearly inspired by the old Sega games from the class Castle of Illusion and Walls of Illusion, which I played quite a lot. So for your both your experiences, did you is it like an amalgamation of all these classic 90s uh, Disney games, or was there another source of inspiration? Massive Mickey Mania fan. I am I loved Mickey Mania. Uh, I think I, during the process, I mean, we've, we're, we've always been Disney fans and always been fans of Disney games. And I think like from, I played them as a kid. And then even when we started kind of looking at what we wanted to do with Disney Illusion Island, I kind of uh, bought pretty much every Disney game that had been made from, uh, I even bought like the Japanese Famicom ones all the way up to like the modern ones just so I could play them, see how they kind of animate them, see what they make the characters do and get kind of like a feel of how those characters were used and that IP was used kind of like throughout time. Um, I would say, yeah, it's probably the biggest inspiration from my perspective are World of Illusion, Castle of Illusion, Mickey Mania, but then also uh, more modern games like Ori and the Blind Forest, stuff like Guacamelee, Hollow Knight, um, and Rayman, all the Rayman games especially, um, and just kind of the how we've kind of, how video games in general have kind of like adapted kind of movement and how kind of fluid movement works. We kind of, from my perspective, like Illusion Island is all about that kind of free flowing freedom of movement that you have. So like looking at kind of those modern classics like Rayman was a massive, massive thing. Now, the big difference with, uh, I mean, when I look at Castle of Illusion, there is a little semblance of combat, and so the, so are the two recent Rayman games, the ones with the new art style and the four-player co-op thing. I see Illusion Island is taking a very different approach. I mean, it's part search action game, like you said, Ori of the Blind Forest, the inspiration, and there's no combat, and there's a four-player co-op. How did the team approach this train of thought? Was it from pre-production, you've already decided from the get-go, no fighting with these four characters, uh, Mickey, Donald, Goofy, and Minnie Mouse. And oh, was it something that was halfway done and be like, oh, I guess we don't need combat since we have all these <laughs> levels all structured. So how was that thought process like? Yeah, it was It was somewhere in between what you said. So um, from the start, uh, kind of Grant and I's process was we come in here in my office and we'd figure out like what is, what is everything the game could be. And we'd write all our ideas on post-its and we just covered the walls in these post-its. Um, and as we were sculpting actually what the game was, the post-its would come down and they'd go in the bin. And then the idea is that what is left is Illusion Island. Um, and combat stayed up there for a long time. Um, com we actually did combat. We started combat in pre-production. We, we weren't sold on it. We didn't think... Like, the only reason we had combat even on the wall was because we were like, oh, we're... We're basically basically making a metroidvania and metroidvanias always have combat um and so then we were like okay well like let's let's do this naturally like as we're designing the enemies like let's just pick the ones where it makes sense that you can jump on their heads um and so we started pre-production and by the time we had about 11 or 12 enemies we realized that really like one and a half two of them we'd put the ability to jump on their heads and the rest of them we'd stopped you doing it and we were like Oh, I think I think we're telling us that we don't want combat. Um, and so like Grant and I then had the conversation. We were like, okay, like, why do we want combat? And like neither of us wanted it. We were both like, well, we don't want it. We just think we should have it. And so we were like, well, when have we ever done something just because we should do it? Uh, so we, we took the post it off. We threw it in the bin. Um, we phoned Kelsey, our producer at D Disney that night. And we were like, look, this might sound scary, but we're getting rid of combat. We don't want combat. We don't want jumping on enemies' heads. Um, and Kelsey was great and Disney were great. And they were just like, okay, like, can you just explain your decision? And so we explained like it didn't work with the game. Um, 
for us, it didn't make sense for the characters. There are these four wonderful friends on an adventure. Why are they jumping on people's heads? It felt weird as well because, you know, this game isn't in Mouston. Like, this isn't a new place. So for Mickey and friends to turn up on an island and then just start killing off the native people of that island felt very wrong to us. Um, so kind of we were like, no, that didn't make sense story wise. Um, and then I think like you tell a good thing about like the multiplayer, right? Like, yeah, so it, it kind of the kind of ethos that we had is awesome alone, better together. And as soon as you put like enemies in a situation where you can like uh, kill them or disable them, if there's four of you running through the level, the first player gets to the enemy, knocks the enemy out. The other three players have absolutely nothing to do at that point. So in removing the combat element for it, every single player has to do that movement of avoidance from the enemy. So it essentially means that no player misses out and every player gets the same experience as they go through. I think the four player thing also works out well because especially when you're fighting some of the bosses where there are some things you need to multitask per se. Now, when you were starting out creating the game, was four player co-op already in every developer's mind or was it added halfway through? No, we knew we were going to do co-op like we had our like our three main pillars for the project from the very first creative deck were um, playable cartoon, uh, authentically Disney, distinctly Delala and awesome alone better together. So we knew from day one we were doing four player and we knew it was going to be Mickey, Minnie, Donald and Goofy, even though the team are really angry at me that I haven't put Daisy in the game. Um, but yeah, we, so we knew from the very first day that anyone picked up a pen or started coding, everyone knew we were making a four-player game. Now, um, would giving four of these characters, I mean, Dizzy, I'm sorry, uh, Mickey, Donald, Goofy, and Minnie, like if you gave them different abilities, would that just make the process unnecessarily longer? Or were there any thoughts about making each character different or is it all going to be uniform all the way through? Like... Uh, so we did originally during pre-production, we did look at all the characters having different abilities um, and, you know, having it that you need to play as a certain character to access certain certain parts of the world. Uh, we slowly realized at that point that I like Donald and I don't want to play as anyone other than Donald. So why would you force me to play as anyone else? And people had favorites. So we, we were just like, it makes sense for all the characters to have the same abilities. They're all animated different and they all use different items for those abilities. But it means that if someone wants to play the game all the way through as Donald, they can. If they want to play it as Minnie, they can. And we're not locking off kind of any content to them because of them having a favorite character. Now, I want to get to the animation portion. That's all really good uh, artwork you guys have done. Like, Lala Studios, I'm going to say that you guys did everything right. Uh, you basically created a Disney cartoon from scratch, in other words. <laughs> well, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Now, uh, how was that process like working with Disney? Horrible. They're all horrible people. Quick, save us. Um, no, it was it was it was so easy. Um, it was it was weird. Like we came in thinking like, OK, you know, Mickey's got a nearly hundred year legacy. He's the mascot of the company. These are four of the most famous characters ever in history. Um, this is going to be hard. Um, and it wasn't like, you know, we did new designs for the four characters. You know, there's only been like 10 or 11 designs for Mickey Mouse in nearly a hundred years. So like, you know, we did these new designs and we went through the process and we explained, you know, hey, you know, we want certain things to be big on screen for when we pull the camera out, which is why our characters have like big hands and big feet and, you know, we wanted to take influence from the 30s and 40s, which is why we've gone for like the white face approach. Um, and then we've like elongated the limbs because it's a platformer, changed Minnie's outfit, etc. And like they were, everyone was on board 100% completely like agreed with what we were doing, what we had done made sense. Um, and it was like that the whole time. Like the, the biggest thing we kind of learned, and I think it has really helped us develop as a game studio from... Disney's like from what Disney taught us is like the journey is just as important as the result. Like Disney really pushed us to think about like, hey, just because you've drawn something and you love it straight away, don't stop there. Like do some other options because it will either show you that there's a better option or it will show you that you've made the right choice. Whereas 
traditionally as a studio and and normally because of our time constraints for like a project like battle toads but normally we would be like oh my god yes i love this character design start animating it um or like yes we love these animations go to cleaner um and disney really started make, really helped us to appreciate the journey and that's almost become a core tenant of how we work as a studio now um so we learned a lot from that perspective obviously like getting to deliver animations to like Disney animation studios from a franchise sign perspective was incredible getting to work with people like Chris Painter who's like narrative lead and designer there um Chris really helped me to understand how to write for these characters um but yeah like I'd love to even with Disney on the call I'd love to give you juicy gossip about how they were a big mean publisher and IP holder but um making this game was the easiest experience for us in terms of a publisher relationship we've ever had like it it was just collaborative they were so supportive it was very clear like you know the thing that they drove home that luigi and john drake drove home from day one is like they want to work with us because they want a delala game like they want a mickey game that only delala can make they don't want to hire us to make a, a disney game that disney could make because that's a silly way for them to operate so they embraced us and our kind of quirkiness and the way we do stuff and our passion and um yeah it was really the first time i truly and i don't know how you felt um but for me it was the first time i truly felt i was allowed to just be me the whole time yeah. and that any notes and feedback we got is because they wanted the project to be better it wasn't because they wanted to look like they were working um yeah. so yeah like it's yeah it, it was honestly wonderful all right, so I've noticed in the older games, they actually use like inspirations from past animations to create the monsters. When I played through Illusion Island from start to finish, everything like basically, it's like a Delala style, like with the monsters and everything. Everything just felt like it was all from you guys in that sense. Like, I mean, the, obviously the only Disney characters I felt who were there were, of course, the main characters. Everything else just felt very fresh. So I just want to ask like, what is the Lala's inspiration for creating Illusion Island and creating characters like Madzi and uh, Liberian and whatnot? Our inspiration, obviously Disney, right? So there's a lot of it. Well, we wanted to make sure that when we made these characters, it felt right when Mickey was speaking to them. Like the way we kind of view it was like, we don't want people like Mazzy to look like they came from Mouston, but at the same time, Mazzy could go on vacation to Mouston and you wouldn't be like, oh, that character style doesn't work with Mickey Mouse. Um, so we took a lot of inspiration from like, you know, the you know the legends like Glen Keane and stuff. You can see a lot of kind of those sort of, that, that sort of inspiration in there. Um, and it was really just about embracing the silliness of it all, to be honest. Like, I'd love to tell you that um, I would hand Lucy, who was our art director and character designer, I'd love to tell you I'd hand her like, detailed briefs but actually what i would do is be like okay so there's this character called old timer mm. i see them being a little bit like betty white meets and then i'd like give her like random references and then be like here's here's old timers three most important personality traits and then lucy would go away and do like a shotgun blast of like quick sketches of like okay well when you talk about this character this is what i feel um and then we'd kind of hone in and be like oh yes i love this like an old one i like this bit of this can we bring these together um but lucy's character design is just so naturally creative she was like our main character designer on battletoads as well and she designed all the weird little creatures in that um but i think i think there's a lot of the disney like there's a lot of 30 to 40 years plus each of us being Disney here, like fans, right? So I think you can feel a lot of that Disney coming through in the character design. Um, but it was really just about how do we make the people of Monoth feel like they're from Disney, but feel like they're unique? Like this is Mickey going somewhere he's never been before. How do we make it feel like these are new characters? What additional challenges does the game have post the credits? So there's lots of hidden collectible types throughout the game. Um, my personal favorite being the hidden Mickeys. Um, which is very obviously influenced by the parks. So there are little and slightly bigger Mickey heads throughout the world. Um, and you'll come across a character who is interested in those. Mm. Um, there's the Mickey memorabilia, which are items you can discover, which are all 
references to Mickey's near 100 year history, all the way back kind of to Steamboat Willie, up to modern day stuff like Potato Land from the modern shorts. Um, tokens. Tokens, yeah. So we've got our tokens, which are collectible cards that all the characters, well, most of the characters on the tokens are actually based on the team that made the game. So we did, Lucy did interpretations of the team visually and I wrote little biographies for each of them. Um, do you want to talk a bit about the accomplishments? Yes, we have a whole list of accomplishments um, for people to pick up um, that work kind of like an in-game achievement system um, from all different parts of the game. Uh, and then there is, can we say the big one? Oh, you're trying to think about there's a, the mode. You talk yeah, about the mode. mode. Yeah. yeah, so there's, <laughs> we won't give that spoiler necessarily, but there's a mode that you want, like, if you collect all the collectible glimpses in game, which are like our little blue glowy things, mm -hmm. you'll unlock another mode in which you can replay the game with an extra layer of challenge, basically. Is that Iron Mouse mode? Because I think I saw an achievement for that. It is, yes, oh, it is, okay, 100%. Yeah. Oh, wow. um, I'll try it. Yeah, right. so, like, yeah, so that was really exciting to hear. All right, so, of course, what can you tell me about Iron Mouse mode, like, try to be as vague as possible like are we talking about new level layouts or new monsters inside or no so it's really it's just a brutal like i mean we can probably say what yeah, it's, it is it's just a mastery of the movement i would say yeah it's you're basically making a commitment and saying i will not die the entire time i'm playing on this save file like that is yeah. the commitment you make um so the world hasn't changed so luckily it's still the world you know and there's no need to do everything over again unless you're crazy like the completionist was. You can just play through the story to get that accomplishment. It's, but It's old school. It's going it's, back to old school. Yeah, it's harkening back to kind of the older, harder platformers and where they were less forgiving of things like death. What was your favourite Disney game during the 90s period and tell me why? Oh, okay. So favourites. That is a completely different question. Yeah, the, um, the one that also inspired you to maybe, hey, I want to make games, you know, in the, in the future and whatnot. Favourite Disney. So it's one of two for me, and I'm going to pick two again. World of Illusion. Um, I still play it now. Me and Mark, who's the IT director here and also my best friend, we used to replay that every year. Like, I love World of Illusion. But I also really, really love that first Toy Story game. Like, the mm. very first Toy Story game I thought was just wonderful. So in terms of Disney games, I think it'd be World of Illusion or Toy Story for me. Uh, mine would be Mickey Mania, just because I feel like it's a good example of showing the history of Mickey Mouse throughout the levels. And then also that first level where it's black and white, and then as you slowly go through it and all the colour starts coming back in. Like as a kid, I thought that was, I thought that was amazing. I mean, I still play Mickey Mania now, but... Yep, yep. <laughs> now, speaking of old Disney games, I gotta ask, I mean, the both of you, Delala as well, I mean, like, what would be... A game that we do like if you could just pick one old Disney nineties game like from that period from the Mega Drive and the SNES era, which game would you would the both of you like to remake? If you had to pick just one. We got to remake one of them. Oh I mean it's it's an obvious one for one of the Donald Duck games for me, I think. Like Quack Shot or Maui Mallard. Um I mean, Luigi would be happy to hear us say Maui Mallard because it was the first game he worked on. Um, yeah, I think one of the one of the Duck games, either one of the Donald games or DuckTales. I would say Chip and Dow or Tailspin. Oh, Tailspin was very good. Yeah. yeah. Chip and Dow or Darkwing Duck. Darkwing all of them. Duck, We're saying yeah. all of them. Can we, can <laughs> yeah, we pick all, all of them? Of them. Yeah. Um, Do you get the Goof, Goof Troop? Do you remember the Goof Troop? Yeah. We control Goofy yeah. and Max. So. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, yeah. If you if you forced us to pick one, forced me to pick one that I'd like to do like a a new a, a spiritual successor or sequel to, probably Quack Shot. I reckon for me. Yeah, mine's Tailspin. And you I'd pick Tailspin. Tailspin. There you go. You got us to commit. We never yeah. commit, and we just committed. 